other. Um, I'm going to call the Monday, September 21st, 2020 Water Board meeting to order. Heather, can you um, please do the roll call? Sure. Chair Williams? Here. Um, Allison Gould? Here. Kathy Peterson? Here. Scott Holwick? Here. Roger Lang? Here. Uh, staff member Ken Hewson? Here. Nelson Tipton? Here. Wes Lowry? Here. Kevin Bowden? Here. David Bell? Here. Francie Jaffe? Here. Jason Elkins? Here. And Heather McIntyre is here. And no council member Martin yet. Okay. Well, before we get further into the agenda, I just want to welcome Scott Holwick to his first um, water board meeting. Welcome, Scott. I'm glad you could join us today and going forward. So thank you for your, your time. Um, with that, I'm gonna go on to item number three, which is approval of the previous month's minutes. Um, is there any, are there any questions or comments on the August 17, 2020 water board minutes? Hearing none, um, <clears throat> I need a motion to approve a motion and a second to approve the August water board meeting minutes. So moved. Okay, Roger, we have a, a motion. Is there a second? Second, Kathy Peterson. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, next item, oh, go ahead. Just for the record, I, I abstained from voting since I wasn't at the last board meeting and have no right. idea what the minutes say or don't say relative to that. <laughs> we appreciate that. Thank you, Scott. For the record, thanks. Sure. Um, next item, item four is the water status report. Is that Wes or Nelson who's gonna handle that one? I'll give that information. The flow of the St. Brain at Lions Gauge at 8 a.m. today was 18 CFS with a 124 year historic average of 55 CFS for this date. The call on the St. Brain Creek is James Ditch, admin number 8756, with a priority date of June 2nd, 1868. The call on the main stem of the South Platte River is North Sterling Canal, admin number 26,302.2392. With a priority date of January 5th, 1922. Ralph Price Reservoir at Button Rock Reserve is currently spilling with 20 CFS being released. And Union Reservoir is at 25.1 feet or down approximately 2,000 acre feet. And that's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Wes. Are there any questions on the water status report? And please speak up. I, I don't have a screen where I can see everybody right now. So if anybody has any comments, please just speak up. Um, okay, with that, we'll go on to item five, um, public invited to be heard in special presentations. Heather, you mentioned there was one person who did want to speak. Are they, are they with us? Yes, they are. Um, okay. Lisa, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute. Looks like you are able to unmute. So if you yep. would please state your name and address for the record, and then um, Chair Will Williams will give you three minutes to speak. Um, hi, this is Lisa Flynn, and I live at 9998 Weld County Road 1 here in Longmont. Um, and I actually just had a couple of questions. Um, one was uh, we have a, a half a share to the bonus stitch, and um, we have a meeting coming up on the 29th. And so I was curious as to what the, um, the additional benefits and values um, to the um, minority shareholders were that were mentioned in the letter, and then um, what, the, uh, water, um, uh, what the water is gonna be used for. Um, and um, Heather did tell me that this was a comment period, so, um, but I will be en route um, next Tuesday for the phone call. I'm not sure I will be in a good traffic area. So I thought I would try this avenue first. Lisa, thank you for your comment. Um, I, I talked just briefly, I think Ken um, 
uh, Houston would be the one to maybe answer those questions that you have. Ken, um, are you on? What, what would be the best way for Lisa to get in touch with you to get answers to those questions? Um, yes, Lisa, thank you. I'm Ken Houston, the Water Resources Manager for the City of Longmont. And we are indeed um, having a special uh, stockholder meeting of the bonus ditch to talk about a potential change case the city will be filing and uh, want to talk to the shareholders. Um, there's a, a lot of, of ish, a lot of things that go around uh, uh, a change case in water court. And so just to be real brief, we're changing, we're basically adding um, additional uses, mostly augmentation to the decree. So it doesn't take away from the decree, it adds to the decree. And I'd be happy, I'd love to be able to talk to you about it. If you could just give me a call at my office number, um, I, uh, I can go over the entire case with you and you can call me anytime. I have it forwarded to my cell phone so you'll get me either way. And my office number is 303-651-8340. And I'd be happy to try to give you, and yeah, if you can't make that meeting then I'll be, it'd be really good for me to uh, talk to you beforehand. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I will uh, reach out offline then. Okay. Thank you. thank you, Lisa. Have a good day. You too. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Ken, are there any um, special presentations today? I have none. Okay. Um, then we're on to item six, which is agenda revisions and submission of documents. I, I do have one agenda revision. Um, we're going to have Dave Hayes join us for the item on the Windy Gap firming project. Um, he, he can answer any questions you might have about the actual allotment contract or the other contracts, as well as give you a little bit of a background on some of the legal aspects of that case or of that agreement. So um, he was not available until about 3.20, 3.30. And so um, with your indulgence, I'll, we'll postpone item 8A until about 3.30 when Dave will be able to be on the uh, meeting and then uh, we can go ahead with Cash and Lou and if need be some of the items from staff. Okay, so we will um, address 8B um, before item 8A based on Ken's comment. So just everybody be aware of that. Um, the next item we have is development activity. Um, I did not see any, is that correct, Wes? That's correct, we have none this month. Okay, well with that, we, we move right into um, 8B, which is a cash and lieu review. Wes, are you gonna handle that? I will, and since we have 20 minutes, I'm going to talk <laughs> very slowly. <laughs> no, um, so um, included in your quarterly review, we have some information as you've seen before, the three basic criteria um, that you're using to set cash and lieu. I think it's on page 76 of your packet. Uh, the first one was the native basin water rights transactions. Um, still really just limited transactions that have occurred, those being Lake McIntosh and Oligarchy Ditch. And uh, at an average cost of a, just a little over $15,000 an acre foot. Those are consistent with what you saw in the last quarter quarterly review. Um, the second one, the, uh, number two, the cost for new water supplies. Um, the only, uh, no, let's see, those numbers stayed the same. We looked at the um, Bureau's Reclamation Construction Cost Index, and as it turned out, it was the same as the last quarter. And so there really was no adjustments. We had just um, updated those in the last quarter, especially for uh, Windy Gap. So you see that the, um, the average for them is 17,788 with a weighted average that was based on the firm yield for their respective, or their dry yield, sorry, uh, for their respective um, water supplies at 16,660. And then I'll remind Water Board that currently cash in lieu is uh, what the Windy Gap Firming Project amount was, which is set at $17,683 an acre foot. So the, the new information in this, uh, in this quarterly review would be number three, the CBT allotment units. And so if you were to 
scroll down uh, to the next page. It'll probably come, uh, Heather will probably pull it up for us. But in June, we had 167 units that were transferred at an average cost of $78,703 an acre foot. Then in July, we had 73 units transferred at an average of $78,560 an acre foot. And lastly, in August, there were 67 units that transferred it at an average cost of $76,579 an acre foot. So the average of all those uh, three months was just a little over $78,000 per acre foot. So as, as we've seen, quite, uh, quite expensive relative to the construction cost of new water supplies and any native basin water rights transfers. So um, other than that, there's really nothing real new to report, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to take those. Are there any questions for Wes? And, and, and Wes, I'd also, I don't know if um, any of the water board members happened to catch it in the newspaper last week, but the town of Wellington up just north and east of Fort Collins a little bit, just increase their cash and lieu price to a little over $100,000 an acre foot. Um, and, and that was a, that was quite an increase for them. And it's made quite an impact. Uh, it, it made a little bit of a splash on the local news up there. So um, it's just, if, if, you, if you don't have a, you don't have availability of good local supplies or things like the Windy Gap Firming Project or some of those um, supplies. Uh, the alternatives are pretty expensive. One, maybe I'll, I'll mention a couple of things for Allison and Scott's benefit. Um, I think I know this is the first time I think we've um, gone over this with the two new board members. Um, you know, what, what we try to do is visit this quarterly to make sure that the cash and lieu rate for the city of Longmont is kind of staying up with what we believe is the current cost of developing new supplies within the city so that developers are truly paying their own way and they're, they're paying it at the current rate we expect it to cost the city. Um, a couple other notes under the cost for new supplies, um, you'll notice that water conservation is lower than the when you get firming project and then we have a, a cost estimate for Union and Button Rock. Um, enlargements. Underwater conservation, you know, I guess one question would be, why don't we maybe lower that cash and lieu? I think that the thought of the board um, in the past has been that's kind of there's limited um, amount of water development that can be done at that price. Um, and we have a, a entire water conservation plan that we're trying to enact. So, you know, if you tried to say, hey, we get $10,600 per acre foot on developing large quantities that that really doesn't hold um, very well. And then on the union and the button rock, those are just kind of, those are cost estimates that were done quite a while ago. And I believe staff tried to update those to current standards in terms of, you know, construction pricing, but um, those would take a lot more effort than I think what is um, to actually build those in terms of permitting and, um, you know, getting them ready for construction. So those are kind of estimates more than they're probably, you know, hard costs at this point. The Windy Gap Firming Project, on the other hand, is a lot more vetted. There's actually a, a contractor that's been selected um, and is given a bid for the project. Um, there's kind of questions with regards to the timing and related cost of the project, but that one is uh, kind of a different level um, in terms of surety with regards to cost than the other items listed under um, you know, the, the cost for new water supply. The one other thing I'd maybe mention is under native water supply, you'll notice those are lower, but those are limited as well, both for Lake McIntosh and oligarchy. Um, the city has allowed people to dedicate that as non-historic water, and that continues to happen, but the city has not chosen not to date to try to get into those markets um, and buy those supplies directly. So, that once again would be somewhat limited as to the amount of water could be that could be developed in, in that way. Um, Ken or Wes, is there anything else you guys want to mention 
I guess on those items, I'm just thinking so Scott and, and Allison can maybe understand this a little bit better, how the process works and maybe a little background behind the numbers. Yeah, I, I appreciate you doing that, Todd. Um, and, and that's all really spot on. Um, there, we really have been um, focusing on the Windy Gap firming project for all of the reasons that Todd outlined and, and they're all, all good and valid. Um, and then the other half of the uh, equation of that is that money that we get for cash and loo currently, as well as in the foreseeable future, will go to actually pay for the Windy Gap firming project itself. That's actually where all of our cash and loo that we'll, we have will have accum accumulated at the time that we um, uh, post our, our cash, our money for the Windy Gap firming will go up uh, to that project. And so the most fair, equitable thing to, to compare the cash in lieu of is the Windy Gap firming. Not only will we use it at the time of construction, but in the, in the near term uh, for the next three, four, five or so many years, we'll also use it to help pay off the bonds because of the 40, 40, approximately $49 million cash that we need to come to the table with, 36 million will be from the bond that was approved a couple of years ago by the voters, by the citizens um, for the Windy Gap Firming Project. So when we take out that bond, we'll have to pay those bonds off and we'll, part of that um, money to pay those bonds off will be cash in lieu. So that's really why um, more recently we've been looking fairly um, closely at the, the Windy Gap Firming Project as the um, appropriate venue to, to, chart, to com compare and set that cash in lieu. Um, and I'll add that just kind of as a, just general numbers. Um, so since we've started taking cash in lieu in about 1965, we have uh, received around a little over $11 million in cash in lieu. Um, with about a little over a third of that just in the last eight years. So um, more people for development have chosen to use cash in lieu as opposed to transfer of non-historic water rights as they're allowed in the raw water requirement policy, primarily for availability. And because they're able to explain that to the bank is usually paying that up front um, to just get a bill. And so we've had some conversations very recently uh, with Markel Holmes, who's doing a large development, and they're putting in their financing. We're expecting to get a check for a little under a million dollars um, soon. And then there's another large development that might be around that. Um, we'll see. It's 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 kind of a difficult gauge. They really have to wait to the last minute. But um, those are some of the bigger numbers that we're expecting to be coming through uh, as it relates to cash and lieu in the near future, though. Thank you, Wes and Ken. Um, Scott or Allison, do you guys have any questions um, with regards to the cash and lieu, um, how it's calculated or the history of that? No, thank you. Mr. Chair, I have a, just a quick maybe observation slash question. So as I understand it, then the Windy Gap firming project is kind of the, the metric um, on which we uh, proceed forward at least now because it's relevant it's timely it's the cost of water development the other um the native basin water rights transaction cbt allotment costs kind of a check and balance so if those things skewed wildly in a different direction that would cause us to potentially rethink or relook at our underlying assumption that the windy gap firming project costs are probably you know valid is that the way we'd look at that and i i can give you a little bit of my thought and then Wes and Ken can step in if, if need be. I, I think, you know, maybe a little history there is when I came on the board, um, the CBT price was the metric that was used. And then I think as we proceeded and, and the Windy Gap firming project became, um, you know, closer to receiving the necessary permits and then firmed up the construction price, 
obviously there's a huge swing there um, in terms of order of magnitude of CBT prices in relation to to Windy Gap. So we did have that discussion, Scott, with the city council at that point, and there was a decision at that point to try to tie it to the kind of actual true cost of developing additional supplies. So you're right, I think those do give kind of almost like book in the, you know, give you some relative cost. And as Ken mentioned, some entities are out there using CBT and, you know, the um, Wellington using 100,000 versus the 78,000, that may be what yield they give for a CBT unit may account for that difference, but just gives you some idea of the, the other options to develop supplies. But, you know, like I said, there has to be a little context given when you start looking at those of, you know, what is kind of behind the numbers. And, um, you know, the, the main reason is because we're moving forward with Windy Gap Firming, that's the, the, the direction we're going. We're using those prices, but this does give us some context to what the cost of developing other supplies is. So, yeah, I, I think that does give that, that information, as you mentioned, Scott. Anything, um, Ken or Wes, you want to add to that? No, I think that was excellent, Todd. I, I I do. I think it has it has been. You know, we have continued to monitor the CBT because I think even though it, we made a decision quite a while ago that we wouldn't be out in the CBT market, <laughs> obviously you can see why. Um, we still think it's valuable to track that and know know where that's going because um, it does it does give a bigger picture of what's happening in the water world, um, you know, uh, in Northern Colorado. And uh, um, if nothing else, it, it, it lets you appreciate prior water boards and councils that helped us develop a wonderful, a great water system here and how valuable that is. I guess if, unless there's other questions, what, um we need to do today is um, come up with a, a recommendation um, for the, the city council as to the cash and lieu rate. Um, if we follow what we've done previously, the Winnie Gap firming project is at the 17,683. I guess that Ken and um, Wes, that's where we're currently at, right? So I guess the question would be, do we need a motion to you know, reaffirm that? Or if we're gonna, if we decide to leave it the same, do we need a, a motion and a second on that? I don't need a formal motion if you don't want to change just your recommendation as such. Okay. I guess with that, I'll ask the board, is there um, anyone who wants to entertain or, or recommend a um, cash and lieu price other than the 17683 related to the Winnie Gap Firming Project? And um not hearing anybody and like I said I can't see everybody so um, anyone okay sounds like we're gonna leave the the cash and loop price at the current rate of seventeen thousand six hundred and eighty three until we revisit it um, again here in a few months um, Ken are are you guys ready for the 8a discussion um, why don't we go on to 9A and, and we'll jump back to 8A when Dave gets on. That's fine. Okay, so item 9A is the Button Rock Preserve update. And Ken, are you leading that? Yeah, I am. Actually, uh, I'm uh, real happy to report a number of things uh, up at Button Rock. Um, probably the most significant uh, item we have as we've finished all of our interviews for both the senior watershed ranger and the watershed ranger positions, permanent positions up at Button Rock um, in August, um, we have made uh, uh, additional job offers to um, two candidates. Um, and I believe they both passed all their tests. So I think I can, I can give out their names right now. Um, we've selected as the uh, senior watershed Ranger, a gentleman by the name of Price Hadley. Um, Price comes to us from uh, Pitkin County. Uh, he was an open space ranger in Pitkin County, primarily dealing with uh, some property they had on the uh, uh, stream up there, um, 
you know, shoot, I forget the name of the stream now that goes through Aspen, but um, they have they have a lot of um, recreational use of the stream, and so did a lot of, of work with the kayak communities and uh, uh, fishing communities. Um, he also did some work on some uh, Pitkin County open space properties uh, off the stream. So he's got some good uh, uh, forest stewardship abilities as well. Um, so we're, we're real excited to get Price on. He'll be starting uh, Monday, the 5th of October. And then um, our, this will be the first year that we've been actually been able to hire both a full, uh, a regular senior watershed ranger as well as a full-time uh, assistant watershed ranger. Um, we've converted, we had the watershed ranger and then we had two uh, seasonals. We've converted one of those seasonals to a permanent uh, position. And so now we'll have the senior watershed ranger, the assistant watershed ranger, as well as a, a seasonal next summer. But um, our current seasonal, uh, Miles Churchill, uh, was selected for um, the assistant watershed ranger position. And, uh, you know, I, I can't give enough of a shout out to Miles. He, he essentially was there alone all summer um, through the entire COVID situation, um, Button Rock. Everybody else kept closing stuff, which kept putting more and more and more pressure on Button Rock Preserve. At, at, at one time, we had the entire parking lot full, people parking a mile and a half up the road at a school bus turnaround, parking on the county road down below that, hiking in a mile and a half just to get to the facility because it was one of the few facilities that was open. And, and Miles hand, handled it wonderfully, and, and I just, you can't, so, so I'd really like to give a shout out to him. So we're now um, fully staffed at um, Button Rock, and, we, and we'll be staffed this way for the winter time period. Um, next spring, we'll hire our a seasonal um, to bring us back up to three. But um, real excited to get them. Uh, they'll both be living up in the area, so we'll have, you know, you, 24 hour um, people up there. They won't be on duty 24 hours, but they'll be there. So we'll, that'll work real good. Um, things are going very well at Button Rock. Uh, the outlet at Button Rock, as, as Wes was telling you a little earlier, is down to 21 CFS coming out of the outlet. That's as low as I can ever remember it being this time of year. Uh, it's just been dry enough this summer that once the last tiny bits of the snowpack melted up up in the high country, um, the creek is creek the creek was running about 50, 40 to 50 percent of normal most of the summer, especially towards the end of the summer, about 40 percent, and now it's even lower than that, and so um, that that's. Um, a little scary this, you know, it's a little early <laughs> to have that lowest snowpack. That's, that's uh, I mean, stream flow, that's kind of kind of tough on the aquatic environment up there. Uh, you know, it's kind of tense. Luck, luckily, the, most of the water is coming out of the reservoir. So that's cooler and that, that keeps the, the stream, kind of protects against those low stream flows that um, if the reservoir weren't there, uh, it'd probably get critically hot. Um, if it were just natural stream flow. So luckily we have that. Um, our, um, as, as you may remember last spring, we, we brought um, information on the uh, management plan that's ongoing up at Button Rock. Um, we're st actually still working on that, uh, doing some of the drafting and we hope to come back, um, we'll come back this fall um, with a draft of that plan um, for Water Board to start looking at. Um, hopefully October or November, but, but hopefully sooner than later. But um, so expect to see that fairly soon. We're, we're getting, you know, we have some good um, data and we, we hope to, to bring that back to the council fairly quickly. So uh, that's about all I have. The, the visitation has luckily dropped off quite a bit. The hot weather always 
kind of pulls back on the visitation at, at Button Rock. So like our parking lot's running about half full now. And so that's really good. It, it kind of back more to a normal visitation. So things are going very well there. And um, we hope to, hope to keep going from there. And then, uh, so that's all I have on, on uh, Button Rock. Then I believe um, Chair Dave, Williams, we did have Dave uh, join us so we can go to item 8A if we're ready to do that. Okay, hey, Ken, do you want to, why don't we finish this this one out and then we can jump over there? Yeah, I, that's all I had on Button Rock, so we're ready to go. You know, I, I did want to make one comment. Um, you know, I think we're, as we're seeing in the, the fires up the Poudre Canyon, um, I mean, that's going to have potential major effects on Fort Collins, Greeley, tri-district water supplies and maybe once again for Scott and Allison's benefit you know my experience on the board to date has been that I think staff has done an amazing job in terms of leveraging some of the city funds and resources to try to do water um, shed management um, kind of thinning of the forests and the watershed going into Button Rock um, which I think you know obviously if, if you can't as we're seeing with some of the fires you can't control um, all of those aspects, especially if it's kind of rough terrain, that sort of thing. So I just, as you, Scott and Allison get further into it, I think there, there's just been a lot of work done historically on making sure that watershed stays as healthy as possible and try to minimize or, um, you know, the, the fire impacts if, if something were to happen. So you, you'll see more about that, but just kind of a little preview um, as we get deeper into it. I think they're there's been good work and hopefully will continue to be good work in that regard, uh, given the importance of that water supply to the city of Longmont's overall water system. So anyway, that's all I had. Do anybody else have any comments um, on the Button Rock Preserve update? No. Okay. And then Todd, one last comment I would, thank you for sure. bringing that up. One last comment I would make about that as well is that um, we have, the city at water board reviewed and, and recommended approval and council approved an intergovernmental agreement with the US Forest Service, Boulder County, and a lot of um, the local um, fire agencies in the St. Vrain Creek Basin, both South St. Vrain and North St. Vrain, including Boulder Creek. But uh, for us, it's really St. Vrain Creek. And that intergovernmental agreement will allow us to work cross boundary um, for the first time since I've ever been here, um, really fires respect no property boundary. So um, it, it's actually kind of an exciting new um, area for us to be able to go into uh, to, to maybe look at a more watershed scale um, fire, per, fire prevention uh, aspect. So thank you for okay. that. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. All right, so now we'll move back up to 8A, which is the Windy Gap Firming Project final allotment contract recommendation. I mentioned to, to Ken earlier um, and Heather that um, I, I think most of you know I'm on the Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District Board of Directors and also the Municipal Subdistrict um, Board of Directors. And based on that, you know, there's obviously going to be that side of it in terms of this allotment contract. Um, it's going to have to go in front of the, the um, enterprise fund, which I'm on the board of directors for. Um, so based on that, I'm going to abstain from the discussion of 8A and I'm going to turn it over. I'm actually going to turn off my video and, and audio. Um, and I'm going to let um, Kathy take over the meeting at 8A and then I'll come back um, once, once you guys are done with that discussion. Go ahead, Kathy. Okay, uh, Kathy Peterson, I'm the vice chair here. And this 8A is the Windy Gap Firming Project final allotment contract recommendation. Um, what we need is a recommendation from the water board to the city council on the final allotment contract, which is now um, has gone from 8,000 acre feet to 7,500 acre feet. And I think, uh, is it Dave Hayes is going to do a little background and review for the new board members or for all of us, would probably wouldn't hurt of how we got here and uh, what we're being asked to do. Cool. 
Thank you, Kathy. Uh, appreciate that. Or Ken is going to. Yeah, I'll, I'll start it and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Dave. Thank you, Kathy, for that introduction. Um, yeah, we have before us the, the actual final allotment contract uh, to take action on. Um, just to kind of real quickly on the history, we, we've uh, uh, for many years have been doing interim allotment contracts as we do the engineering, the, the bidding, the, the high, getting a, a contractor on board. We're now um, getting all the permits, getting everything done, have all been handled with interim allotment contracts. So the final, um, the final allotment contract is really the, it, it will put all of those to, to rest and, and this will be the contract that we'll have um, going forward that will operate the reservoir um, from this point forward. It'll actually be the last, last contract. Um, as you may recall, last August, um, we looked at, or excuse me, last July, we looked at the um, preliminary allotment contract and went to city council on August 4th for uh, direction. Um, water board recommended and council uh, uh, voted to uh, set Longmont's final participation at 7,500 acre feet in the project. And as such, um, a couple of things we needed to do to get that done. The first, of course, was to get a, an allotment contract at the 7,500 acre foot level. We had participated at 8,000 acre foot, foot up to that point. And so we had 500 acre feet um, that needed to be reallocated to other participants. There were two participants that um, had expressed interest for some time that um, either to Longmont or any participants, if they were to go down, they, would, they wanted additional capacity. The first was the city of Loveland and we had uh, worked with them before. Uh, so the city of Loveland had a goal of, of 10,000 acre feet. And they're about 400 acre feet short of that, 413 acre feet short of that. And so of the 500 acre feet, the city of Loveland um, will take 413 acre feet. Um, the other entity, a much smaller entity is the city of Fort Lupton. Um, and so the remaining 87 acre feet, um, they were very happy to be able to have an opportunity to participate. Um, they actually had um, balanced their Windy Gap firming project with the Windy Gap water, parent water that they owned, but they got additional um, Windy Gap parent project water, I believe from Fort uh, Black River Power. And so they needed a little more um, firming project to go with that. So they have actually already taken it to their city council and gotten direction from their city council to go ahead and proceed with 87. So um, we'll, we'll be good for that. So really what I have before you today, um, obviously the most important part is the final Windy Gap uh, allotment contract. That's the bulk of the package, <laughs> 40, 45 some pages. Um, but in addition to, to asking for a recommendation on the firming uh, project allotment contract, I also have attached an escrow agreement. The firming project allows us to either pay cash uh, or to uh, participate in a pooled bond. Uh, because of some, some aspects of our city charter, we're not able to participate in the pooled financing. So we'll be paying cash, even though we'll issue our own bond. Uh, for part of that. So we have an escrow agreement attached. That escrow agreement is basically how we move our money up to Northern Water. They'll set it up in a separate escrow just under our name and they'll pull money out of that as, as needed to uh, construct the project. It, it helps uh, make sure that that's a formal, formal agreement to move that. That's a lot of money to move around. So. That, um, that does that. Um, and then the third and fourth agreements are basically the two IGAs between the city of Longmont and the city of Loveland and the city of uh, Fort Lupton. Um, in essence, what we have to do, we, we do an IGA with those two cities and then together we submit a petition to Northern Water uh, asking them to assign the 500 acre feet of capacity to those two entities. That actually went to 
the Northern Board um, early in September, uh, just as a um, kind of a preliminary review, the, the actual petitions have, was, was not before them, but the concept was, and their board um, agreed in concept that generally the form of our uh, petition application to them was good and that they would generally favor those petitions if they came before them. That's really kind of what we needed to make sure um, everything, it's kind of a chicken and egg, all of this has to fit together. And so we wanted to make sure the Northern Board um, was okay with that and, and they were. They'll actually formally approve it in October, um, but, um, or, or early November, they, they may do a special meeting late October uh, if, if all aspects of the agreement can go forward, if not. Um, one thing I did want to point out on the allotment contract is that in the section under uh, pooled financing, um, that really technically doesn't uh, affect Longmont because we won't be participating in the pooled financing, but there, there is a, a part of that is for a 30 year note, a 30 year bond about half of the pooled financing participants want a 20 year bond and about half of them want a 30 year bond. And so the Northern District is doing everything they can to try to see if they can make that work. Of course, you gotta go, you know, you gotta go to the people that have the money and say, hey, will you do that? <laughs> and so you gotta, you gotta have them smiling when, uh, when you come up with language that will work. So they really are trying hard, but um, there's no guarantee that they'll be able to make that happen. So exactly what happens with the bonding institutions and whether they can make that, that language may tweak slightly between now and when this agreement goes to city council. We're currently scheduled for city council on, on October 13th, but we may have to do it on, on two weeks later um, on the 27th of October when uh, if that language isn't hundred percent done yet. So that we'll, we'll probably know that yet later this week. So, um, but with that caveat, no, knowing that that particular part of the contract isn't 100% um, done, everything for Longmont, we believe is done and, and that language is, is good to go forward. So that's why we're recommending we take action. Um, so that's kind of where we are with all the contracts and with everything that's going on. Um, I would like to uh, turn it over to Dave and let him just kind of give you a real quick rundown of, of what the different sections of the allotment, you know, how, what is, what is an allotment contract, where it goes, just so we have that on the record, and just so we um, give, also give the board an opportunity if there's any part of any of these contracts that you have a, a legal question, um, Dave would be uh, much, well, better situated than me <laughs> to answer those questions. So um, go ahead and introduce Dave Hayes, our special water council and uh, let him jump on as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ken. Okay, go ahead, Dave. Except we can't hear him. I think he's muted. <laughs> Heather, can you see Dave? Yeah, he's muted, I think. Yeah, he's muted. He is muted, hold on one second. Okay, I think. Can you hear we me got now? Got it. Yep. Yeah. We got it. Okay. Technical. Uh, technical <laughs> malfunction. Um, well, it's a pleasure to to appear before you this afternoon. I was telling Ken I've I've been special counsel along with Ray Petros to Longmont, me personally, for about twenty years now, and this is actually the first time I've been in attendance at a uh, water board meeting. I've been to a number of city council meetings and worked with staff countless times, but, but never a water board meeting for some reason. So it's a pleasure to, to meet you, albeit wish it was in person. Um, the allotment contract at its girth of 45 or so pages is a <laughs> creature that's taken a long time to, to get to this form. Um, started negotiations with the, the sub-district and all the participating entities back last, before Thanksgiving, I, I think it was, and had a number of meetings in person up in Berthoud that were long, multi, or well, full-day sessions. 
um, and then eventually moved online and uh, worked through a lot of issues over the, the course of almost the last year. So th- you, you can rest assured this document's been very heavily vetted by a lot of different attorneys, um, not only of, of water interests, but municipal interests and uh, financial interests also. So um, it is safe to say it's it's hopefully in pretty good shape at this point. Um, you know, despite being a hefty document, what it what it really kind of boils down to in a lot of ways is on page seven, paragraph two. Um, that's that's the guts of it. And what it does is it, it is an allotment, uh, a right essentially granted by the municipal subdistrict, the Windy Gap Firming Project Enterprise, um, granting Longmont 7,500 acre feet essentially of capacity or you know roughly 8.33% of the, the project, whatever its ultimate capacity will be in the, the Chimney Hollow Reservoir. Um, one way to kind of think of this is uh, from an analogy standpoint is akin to um, shares of stock in a mutual ditch company. Um, the the subdistrict will be the owner essentially of Chimney Hollow Reservoir. Um, as far as title itself goes, but the participants themselves uh, have funded it much like shareholders in a ditch company. And instead of shares of stock, because the, the subdistrict is a creature of statute, a quasi-governmental entity, uh, the, the rights to the use of the, the water rights, and in this case, really the water works, um, are granted to the individual participants in the form of perpetual contracts. So, so that's what paragraph two really does there. It, it allots perpetually Longmont the right to 7,500 units in the project, um, subject obviously to the, the terms and conditions of the contract. Um, so while you could boil it down to that one paragraph as, as to the important part, there, there's obviously a lot more to it. Um, and I'll kind of just give you a quick overview of, of the sort of the highlights of the contract. Um, the recitals sort of outline a little bit of the background about the firming project and recital D actually sort of gives you the roadmap of what the, the four main parts of the contract do. Um, part one being definitions. There, there's quite a few of them. Most of them are f- fairly straightforward and explanatory or self-explanatory. Uh, one, uh, a couple of note would be 1.8 the costs and expenses definitions. There's a a breakdown of various uh, expense categories that'll be associated with the project. Um, Capital uh, funding first to uh, initially construct the reservoir. Um, If there's cost overruns, uh, completion costs and expenses, and then what would typically be considered kind of O&M, which they're calling uh, operating C&E. And then also there's a provision for future extraordinary, say if there was a, you know, a dam failure issue, uh, cost to repair it, that kind of thing. And, and those, how those are handled or spelled, spelled out elsewhere in the contract. Um, another important definition would be uh, 1.27 Windy Gap Firming Project allottee. There's two categories there, as Ken kind of alluded to. There's cash allottees and there's loan allottees. Longmont being a cash allottee, uh, at least initially, because like Ken said, you'll be paying um, upfront from your own revenue sources. Um, so, so into part two uh, of the contract and feel free to jump in if you have questions at any point. Um, like I said, paragraph two of part two is pretty critical there. That's the, the grant of the actual right. Um, Paragraph three or section three there in that part two kind of deals with uh, what happens as the project, as the chimney hall is being built um, before final uh, completion and, and you know, what, what might happen if it's determined to be infeasible, that kind of thing, if, if the project were terminated um, and it establishes when it's considered complete, um, which gets into Paragraph four then is, is uh, operation after completion. Uh, importantly, spells out a few 
key terms, um, but a lot of the operational aspects are, are yet to be determined and, and will kind of be developed through operating experience to some extent and, and also yet to be negotiated through operating uh, principles, which um, Ken has been stressing the need for seeing those sooner than later and is, is um, on the committee that's, that's helping to develop those. Those will be important. Um, kind of jumping through into paragraph 5.3 spells out provisions regarding defaults. Um, that was, that took a lot of time and negotiation among the parties, how um, the process works if, a, if an entity doesn't pay their, you know, assessments and operating expenses on an annual basis, what's the uh, you know, cure period that's developed. Um, what's the penalty if you ultimately don't cure? Um, and what happens if you know a party forfeits its some or all of its interest? Who who gets to take up um, that forfeited interest? So the the five point three is definitional primarily for that, um, and then five point four it kind of gets into. Uh, how that process works, and I'll, I'll get to that here in a little bit. Um, uh, jumping real quick back just to 5.1, it does identify that uh, the operating provisions are perpetual under the contract. A couple of the sections will go away. For instance, the, the construction provisions, section three, um, but, but the, the allotment itself is perpetual. Um, so paragraph six. Dave? Yes. Sorry, this is hey, Scott, Scott. Holdwick. I apologize for interrupting. Uh, you said to jump in. I, I looked at this a little bit because um, <clears throat> that's what I do for a living. And um, I think there might be an inconsistency between paragraph 5.7, the amendments provision, and paragraph 5.8, in particular, subparagraph four. There, there's language that I think is meant to protect Longmont, and I think it's correct in 5.8.4, but I, it doesn't read right in 5.7. So I, I, I don't know if you want to look at it outside of this conversation. It's the last clause, and it looks like it uh, allows the possibility of a material adverse impact on Longmont's rights, whereas I think it should be not result in, does not result in. So I can send that to you in an email if you want, but before anybody signs it at city council, <laughs> If it does operate to be opposite of what you intended or what the group intended, it was just something I caught and I wanted to share with you. Yeah, I appreciate that, Scott. Why don't you send that to me? And um, okay. they are, you know, still amenable to. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. that's an editorial change as much as anything. Although it goes to substance. Correct. Yep. Thank you. Scott, would you mind repeating that, please? Just Sorry, that. Uh, it's under uh, paragraph five point seven. The amendments clause, I think, is one long sentence, and it's the last phrase which talks about um, five lines from the bottom and further provided that this contract may not be amended without Longmont's written consent in a manner that results in a material adverse impact. And it may be correct, it's really awkwardly stated, um, but in 5.8.4 underneath that, it says the exact opposite, or at least is worded the exact opposite way. And so it may just be a really awkward last phrase in 5.7. It may actually mean what it means to say, but it doesn't read very well. And I wanted to at least alert you that it could be read differently, in my opinion. No, that, that's good. There was a lot of last minute um, wrestling with you know, what it takes to amend this contract between the parties. Yeah. And, and so there was a lot of changes there at the end and probably just you know, somehow got inconsistent there. So, so yeah. thanks. And, and it, may, it may mean exactly what it says. Anyways, Dave, I may be misreading it, but it was awkward to read. So I thought I'd point it out. Okay, well, we'll look at that and we'll talk with Bennett also about it. Um, also, I had a quick question regarding the enterprise board rules and regulations. Those are specifically referenced here in. Um, have those been reviewed? Do we have copies of those? We do not, they have not been promulgated to date and we bet we have asked them about that um you know that was <laughs> that the operating rules the enterprise board rules have been a bit of a concern that we've we've raised issues about in the past as to 
um, you know, whether that could uh, impair the right we think we're getting. And they, they've tried to address that through some of the language that Scott was just alluding to about, you know, nothing can met, result in a material adverse impact to the rights under this contract. And that that's sort of strewn throughout here in a number of places, but, um, you know, obviously we, without seeing those, we, there's probably a minor degree of risk there. Okay. And similarly with exhibit B, it looks like that is a TBD. In here real quick. So, yeah, so that would be, um, that applies to, yeah, because there's no, those costs wouldn't be known at this point. So those would be populated once, uh, that applies to if there's costs beyond the initial estimate to construct or the future extraordinary would be, you know, a, a dam problem that had to be corrected down the road. And there's a process, you know, just jumping into that, the, the way the allotment contract spells things out right now for the initial funding for construction, Longmont's a cash allottee, but if those future costs are presented, Longmont has a choice. They can decide whether to be a cash allottee or a pooled finance allottee in that case. Um, and the default, if you don't make that choice is you become a pooled finance allottee. So, so that exhibit B spreadsheet would populate once those costs are known. And are, are we going to have any sense of that prior to the October um, board meeting? Um, I'm sorry, the board meeting of the city council? Of the sense of that being? Uh, which direction um, we'll be going as far as that default kicking in or not? Oh, well, those would only be, you wouldn't have to decide until those actually came up. Okay. Right now, the, the, the city has determined it would be a cash allottee for the, the initial financing. Okay. So that 30 year bond is completely inapplicable under the current service. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that, that goes into part four of the contract, which really doesn't apply to Longmont's current position for the initial capitalization. Okay, thank you. And I have a couple other questions, but um, it, yeah, just let you go on. Um, okay. Um, so I think I was actually kind of getting into the funding provision there just about to, in part two, section part six, um, the, the Windy Gap Firming Project funding. And so there's a you know, the, the initial capital costs, there's, you're either a, a cash participant um, for the, the initial $600 million um, or, a, or part of the pooled financing provision. And then 6.2.2 kind of gets to that completion C&E costs and expenses. If, if that initial estimate of $600 million, if it winds up being 800 million, the parties are gonna have to figure out you know how to, how to fund um, the additional 200 million, whether they want to pay it up front or or be part of pooled financing for that. And same with 6.2.3. That's you know if there's a crack in the dam or whatever, you know, 20 years from now, the the parties need to decide how they pay for that. Um, so that that paragraph sort of spells out the procedure for uh, for initial and future financing. Um, there's also reserve funds that'll be maintained uh, for both operating O and M expenses and um, within the, the the pooled financing people. There's sort of a, a I don't know a pre prepayment kind of pool that's maintained in case somebody defaults to make sure they make their bond payments on time. Um, and those are kind of all spelled out in, in section six. Uh, so section part three. Uh, section seven, this is what's applicable to Longmont currently for the initial capitalization. Um, basically Longmont will pay it's almost $50 million uh, over to the subdistrict. They'll hold it in, in escrow um, pursuant. And there's a separate escrow agreement that's, that's an exhibit. And they've also set up as the, the final agreement for execution. Um, basically uh, the subdistrict or the enterprise at least of the subdistrict will hold that cash and invest it um, pursuant to some investment standards they've adopted. 
um, and you know, out, dole out those funds pro rata for each entity that they're holding the money for as as construction costs are incurred. Um, and you know, to the extent there's there's surplus cash left over that they've kind of kept in segregated accounts for each entity, um, and they'll report regularly and and um, provide auditing information. Um, to the extent there's there's any money left over, knock on wood, there at the end it, it'll be refunded um, to the city. And then part four, as I mentioned, really applies to the the loan allottees and the pooled financing, and that's a little more complicated um, just because they have to sort of manage where the funds are going and, and what's getting paid off first as far as the the bonds and and all that. Um, I mentioned the uh, default provisions and how those apply there. They, they vary a little bit between whether it's for the pooled financing payments, whether it's for, you know, whether you default on your initial cash cash payment um, and then also as to O and M payments. But the, the basics are there's, there's a, about a year period for each one that's applicable. If you, if you miss your initial deadline, you have um, uh, they send out the, the enterprise sends out a notice and you've got a period to cure. Um, if you don't cure by really over a year in the end, then you've, the, each you're, you've defaulted as a final default and you forfeit essentially um, your, your interest and in, you know, how much of that interest depends on uh, sort of your non-equity interest that you would forfeit at that point, plus a penalty of, um, of a vested interest in some cases. Um, so it's, it's kind of a balance of giving enough time to make sure you, these entities have time to pay if they run into trouble, but also providing a pretty strong incentive and a heavy penalty if you don't ultimately. Um, and again, that was a pretty controversial <laughs> issue to try and work through. So it's, it's fairly complicated terms. Um, but that, that's sort of the overview of the contract. It, it's, Obviously, the details are, are fairly complicated, but that gives you an overview, I think. Sounds good. Any more questions for Dave? Allison, did you want something else answered? Yes, thank you, Vice Chair Peterson. Um, mm -hmm. I did have a couple of questions. Um, sorry, I'm just scrolling up to where it is. Um, specifically regarding the operating CME or O and M. Um, the last. What, what page are you on? Just like, page three of the agreement, page 12 of our packet. It's uh, paragraph 1.8.2. So definitions, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, there, the last line, um, operating CME specifically includes any and all costs and expenses that are not capital CME that may accrue after execution of this contract. That seemed fairly open-ended to me. Um, as did number three to meet regulatory requirements associated with the WGFP. That's um, the third uh, item in that list. And specifically, I was wondering, given that the federal case is still uh, outstanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, would that include additional litigation that Longmont might be on the hook for as far as funding to get that permit in place? Well, so the intent, I think, of the subdistrict is that any funding won't occur until the federal litigation's finished. Um, so I'm not sure the allotment contract will be kicked in until the, the litigation's finished at this point, um, but I'm I could be confusing that at this. Ken, do you recall, were they gonna handle through further interim agreements until these were all executed? Um, no, they're, they're so, so they've made a decision. I, I think if I describe how the Pooled financing folks are going to get their money. Um, it, it might help. Uh, 
the pooled financing participants have two pots of money they're going to go for. The first is the Colorado Water Conservation Board has approved a loan in the in the sum of ninety million dollars, which we call a subordinate loan because it will be subordinate to the um, the, the issuance of the bonds for the pool, and so the the remainder. Of, of the money, which is the bulk of the money, three or $400 million that the pooled financing folks will take, they'll, they'll, they'll issue a bond and then following up, the original plan was that would be followed up with the subordinate loan from CWCV to kind of finish out the construction. And that was really um, the original idea behind that was actually pretty good because the CWCB loan doesn't start accruing interest until you draft on it. Um, you know, when you pull out a, a bond, you have to start paying the interest right away. I mean, you can make a little bit of interest, but usually not as much as you have to pay out. But the CWCB loan was kind of, it was there, it was guaranteed, but you didn't have to draft that money until late in the project. Um, now, because of the federal lawsuit, um, the, the idea is that they're not going to issue a bond, the pooled bond, until the federal lawsuit is done. But, but if, in fact, um, to keep the project moving, especially to keep the, um, the project has some expenses related to environmental mitigation work that was triggered upon the issuance of the federal permit. Um, and, and the federal lawsuit doesn't change that timing. So there's a number of number of things that are going on. In addition, the, the participants are all very interested in keeping the connectivity channel construction on the Colorado River around the Windy Gap Reservoir uh, going because Three fourths of that funding is federal funding that we'll lose if we don't get it built by a certain time. So that project is still kind of going on, um, but but uh, there, there's a number of things like that. So the if we don't get an answer on the federal lawsuit fairly soon, then the trigger is they're going to go the the project will go pull some of that CWCB money. That's what the pooled financing folks will do. The cash financing folks will have to bring an equivalent amount of money to whatever the CWCV draft is or proportionate of that. And that'll go in to do the interim. So that's the interim. If the, if the uh, federal case um, comes back and, and basically the federal case isn't gonna uh, mandate that we do any additional work or any additional things other than it can say the permit's not valid until you study this or you do this or you do something else. And so, yeah, at that point, we would have to go back in and, and do that. And that would require um, possibly even an amendment to the, to the um, allotment contract because that, depending on what the federal court says, um, we're pretty confident they're, you know, we tried to cross every T and dot every I, you know, <laughs> uh, we're, we're pretty confident, but um, you never know what a federal court will say. So uh, there is money in the project. So um, the, the construction bid had one price if we got a ruling last spring. It had another price if we got a ruling in time to start construction this fall, that was about four or five million dollars more. And now that we've missed this fall, um, we're currently talking to the contractor about what the price will be if we can, if we get a ruling and we start next spring. Um, we think that's probably on the order of a similar four, five, six million dollar increase. Um, there is there the the six hundred million dollar price that we're going forward has enough money in there to cover that part of a cost increase. 
because the fall number, had we started work in fall, the bid would have been about 500 and, uh, uh, well, all the, all, the, all the dollars would have been about 580 or $90 million. So still a little bit of money um, for uh, a delay on the federal case until next spring. But if it go if it goes much more, I mean we're getting we're getting pretty tight on on the ability to hold the contractor's feet to the, his bid, as well as um, you know what you, you you can only carry that so long. So yeah, there there is a little bit of a a risk there based on when that federal case comes down. We believe right now we're covered. Uh, with both the estimate, what this contract is bringing forward, plus what um, it will cost us additionally uh, with the contractor for a start of construction next spring. But beyond that, um, if we don't get a, a ruling sometime, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be tough. And Allison, I think, you know, part of your question was, where would the litigation costs fall as far as these C and E's. And, and I think the it would fall under the operating most likely the way these are defined. Okay. Um, follow up question to that. Um, and, and what you just explained, Ken, thank you so much. Um, if the court did come back and indicate that there was a significant amount of work, say it's doable, but it is takes doing would that potentially trigger winding up under 3.4.1, which is on page seven? Um, specifically under the infeasibility and practicability, impracticability and inability to fund. Um, specifically what I'm concerned about there is it, it looks like basically what happens under those circumstances is the enterprise sells to the sub-district and then all the assets are divided up pro rata. And if Longmont's a cash buyer, paying up front would mean we'd have more sunk costs than other parties potentially. And I don't know if I'm understanding this incorrectly, but that, that seems like a potential concern that might be lingering there if things go sideways with the federal lawsuit. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think that's a potential scenario where there could be wound up if it if the, the litigation looked like it would not be a, a positive outcome um as far as the ensuring longmont got back what it had put in proportionately i i, I have to find where it is but i know that was an issue addressed in here that um when refunding money that cash participants got back you know, you, the cash participants money wasn't going to pay the pooled participants way. Um, and I, <laughs> I'd have to dig out exactly where that concept is in here. But I, I know that was an issue that was raised and, and addressed. Okay, and I think it was below, I guess the sentence that got me a little confused was in 3.4.3. Any remaining funds shall then be distributed to the WGFP lotties based on their respective participation percentages. So in that case, Broomfield would get a pretty large chunk, um, even though maybe Longmont paid cash up front. So, so um, Allison and Dave, the, um, the, the allocation of those funds, Longmont's funds will be kept in the escrow, that's part, partly the escrow agreement. Longmont's okay. funds will be kept in escrow. And then as funds are needed for the project, the pooled financing participants funds will come forward. Our funds will come forward out of escrow. So everything that's still in escrow will come back to us. Okay. The only thing that will be um, proportional will be the, the money that's, in, in their case, the money that came in from the loans, and in our case, the money that came in from the escrow, um, and any value of the project that's already built or already started. Um, but we won't, our money, our, all of our money will go up there. That's kind of the assurance that the pooled financing folks have that 
we won't renege halfway through the project, but our money won't go at risk until it's actually needed to be spent on construction. They'll, they'll pull drafts each month, they'll pull money out of that escrow. And, and so the, the, the money that's kind of, the value of the project is what will be divided up. Our full escrow, whatever's left in our escrow account will come back to us fully by the escrow agreement. The, uh, there, there is some, there's some value there right now um, um, in, in property. We, we purchased about, the project purchased about 1,200 acres of land where the reservoir is gonna sit. And so that's a very valuable thing. And if the project doesn't go forward, um, you know, that, that land will be sold and uh, we'll get, uh, again, a proportionate a portion of that money back. Was there ever discussion of a first right of refusal amongst the OITs uh, subsequent if the subdistrict did um, decide not to move forward with purchasing the project from the enterprise or inheriting it from it? Just curious, not that, just curious if that was part of the discussion. I, I want to say yes, but I'm trying to think what context that came up in, if that was the same context. Yeah, I can't recall at the moment. Well, I'm sure this was all negotiated many, many, for many, many years. So um, uh, thanks for helping me understand. I just have uh, one more question, if I may. Go ahead. Um, that is specific to 3.3. I'm not, sorry. Um, the definition of WGFP completion. Um, the way that particular paragraph reads, uh, it, completion is accorded upon final certification of Chimney Hollow Reservoir for storage of water to its full capacity. Mm -hmm. However, the WGFP project is defined in 1.3.1.36. Um, and also includes delivery structures. And so I was kind of wondering about that connectivity and whether the completion, it was considered completion, whether it could actually hold that water or it was actually holding that water such that it was actually delivered from its source and holding the full amount. In which so I, case- I believe, I, I, I believe the 3.3 was intended that when it could hold water, um, basically when the dam safety aspect of the, the uh, dam is certified by the state. Gotcha. So that doesn't necessarily mean that that connectivity structure would be functional. Right, although the, the connectivity piece, I think, are they working on that now, Ken? Is that right? Yeah, there's... Um... Actually, the connectivity channel won't is not part would not be part of what the state engineer's office would either, and they're going to review it because there's a dam over there and that dam gets rebuilt. <laughs> but um, the connectivity channel uh, is it the intention is that it's going to be ready to go, and as long as the project can move forward, that that project will start construction and it's about a one year as opposed to the reservoir is about a three to four year project. So that project will be done um, and, and in operation well before the completion of the dam. And, um, and then you also, there's, there's a connection portion. This, our reservoir has to connect to the CBD system at our dam on this side. And all of that um, will be approved as part of the state. They, they will not um, approve storage in the dam until 
the connection with the CBD system, um, all the valving, every, all of that is done as well. So there's really two quote connections going on. One is connection of the reservoir. The other is a connectivity channel on the west slope. Okay. So that's that's how the, those two are. They're only connected because that connectivity channel is part of the mitigation for the Fermi project. So the, the actual permit won't be issued for dam safety until those are already in place. So this really is the bow on the present <laughs> reservoir. Yeah, yeah. Perfect, thank you guys so much for your patience. I appreciate your answering my questions. Okay, does anyone else have a question? Looks like Scott. Yes, hi, Vice Chair Peterson. Um, it's really a process question and that is, uh, somebody asked if there were any other questions on this document. Are we considering this one separately? Or are we bundling all four agreements into um, a, a, an ultimate action? Um, you know, we'd be happy either way. Um, you know, when city council is going to look, they'll see all four of them as well. Um, we will have to take action on each one of the four at city council because but we'll probably do one resolution approving each one of the uh, so, yeah, you can either make a motion to recommend council approve all four, or you can take action uh, on each one individually, especially if there's, you know, one of the agreements you may not want to recommend. Uh, you can do it either way. Okay. Um, is there any concerns on the four different uh, issues? The allotment contract, the escrow agreement, and the uh, two, the Fort Lupton and Loveland agreements, such that someone would rather we did not do just one motion to recommend to the city council for approval. Scott, hold I, I don't have a problem. I, I just want to understand the process because I had a question on the two um, conveyance agreements with Loveland and Fort Collins, and I didn't want to put the cart before the horse and talk about that if we were piecemealing these and, and dealing with only the, the document in front of us. So I just wasn't certain which way you wanted to go, Kathy. Um, I think from my, what I would prefer is to have one motion because we simply are making a, a recommendation for approval. But if someone else on the board has an issue with that, I, I don't have a problem doing two or three or <laughs> whatever. What, did you actually have an issue with it, Scott? No, not, not really. I think maybe if I may, and you can tell me if I'm out of line. Um, the question I had had to do with the um, sale and purchase um, of the units to Loveland and then the sale and purchase of units to Fort Lupton. And it was just a math question. Frankly, the, the consideration being provided in both cases are, are fairly different on a unit basis. And I didn't know how that was derived. Um, unless I'm reading something way wrong. It looked like one was about $8,000 an acre foot for Loveland, and it looked like about an order of magnitude less than that for Fort Lupton. So I, I just wanted to figure out why, how, how, how long I was being compensated for what they're conveying uh, in these ancillary units that we're no longer subscribing for. Ken, I, maybe you're the one to address that, please. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Actually, what we, um, what we are getting back is our actual cost um, for each entity. Um, and so that should be about the same on an acre foot basis. Acre foot basis? So Ken and I, I, I'm not gonna profess to be a math whiz, but if you guys wanna check that, that'd be helpful because we're getting, it looks like 350,000 from Loveland for 400 units and then 75 for, 87, um, may, maybe that's maybe that's equal. I guess it's probably, maybe it is close. My calculator must not have punched the right numbers, but it, it raised my eyebrow and I wanted to figure out what we were actually getting compensated for. Uh, Cause it seemed like that was a pretty small number given the amount of participation we've had over the years for these units. So it seemed like a small number, just generally. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's based upon our actual cash into the project on a per unit basis at this point. So we're getting back 100% of the money that we invested for those 500 uh, acre feet. Okay. Uh, that we're selling. 
I'll, I'll trust your math versus mine. That was just my question, though. Thanks. Okay, no, I will definitely double check that because I don't want <laughs> I don't want that to be wrong. But I'll, yeah, I'll double check it and ask one of my guys to to triple check me. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think the one is 413 acre feet, not 400, which would make a difference in the per unit. So anyway, okay. Um, any more discussion or questions? None, I'm seeing none right now. I would ask for a motion uh, to approve the four different aspects of the Windy Gap Firming Project final allotment contract as presented. So moved. Um, motion by Roger Lang, the second, anyone? I'll second, Kathy. Second by Scott Hallwick. All in favor say aye and raise your hand please too. Aye. aye. Opposed, same sign. Nothing opposed. So uh, I, that motion passes to recommend to the city council on the final allotment uh, contract for approval. And I will turn it back over to Chair Todd Williams, if he's somewhere <laughs> in the building or in some building, <laughs> to come back on as the chair. All right, thanks, Kathy. Um, all right, so now we're on to item 9B, which is a water resource engineering projects update. Um, Jason, are you going to give that? Yeah, sure am. Hi, everybody. I wanted to give you a quick update on a few of our projects. Uh, the South St. Vrain pipeline, we are currently uh, going through the rehab project. We have installed three permanent uh, access vaults and one permanent access patch. Um, we will then be uh, installing some temporary access points. And then from there, we will start cleaning, jetting, and vacuuming uh, the pipeline. Some of the good news is when we were installing those vaults, um, we actually didn't see a whole lot of debris in there. Um, so we're hopeful that most of the debris is towards the inlet where the water was coming in during the flood and that maybe it just blocked off kind of at the beginning and the majority of the pipe might not be so bad. Um, so we should begin uh, jetting and vacuuming uh, here in the next week or so. And after that, uh, we'll, we'll then uh, start to look at lining the pipe, but that'll be further down, uh, further down the road but we're still on budget and still on schedule to have the South Ukraine pipeline up and running by spring of next year. Uh, the other project uh, I wanted everyone to be aware of was the, the North St. Vrain pipeline. Um, the o &M guys went out and, and they walked the line and they found a handful of uh, significant leaks. We're gonna have to shut the line down, coordinate with uh, LPC to shut down the hydro plant and basically do our annual maintenance patch, make some repairs um, and before we can turn the line back on. Uh, we'll probably be scheduling uh, the North line shut down. Um, I'll get with Ken and Wes, but probably um, in the next month or so. And then uh, lastly, um, for the South St. Vrain pipeline, kind of a, um, uh, another project that ties into that is a pump station that we're looking uh, to install within the town of Lyons. Uh, we currently have um, an RFP out for the design and we'll be selecting uh, an engineering firm the next month and starting uh, design on that and actually moving forward with it. We do have the town of Lyons support. Um, the mayor, trustees understand why we're wanting to install this pump station and they fully support it and they're even going to help us acquire some of the land to do it. Any questions? Any questions for Jason? Thank you for your update. Um, oh, I did have one other thing. Oh, go ahead, uh, Jason. Uh, Button Rock Dam, the outlet works. Um, I think we talked about this last time, had sprung a leak. Um, but in, in, in case uh, I didn't mention this or uh, you don't recall, is um, there was a small leak coming out of the cylinder, um, the cylinder that operates the main gate. Um, as we kind of described it, it looks like a garden hose is on. Um, it's actually sealed itself, but you know, for, for a couple months there, it just was uncontrollably letting water out. Not a big deal, we were able to divert it, but we're gonna have to work with uh, Deer and Alt and uh, their uh, contractor to go up there. We're gonna have to shut down um, the outlet uh, at Button Rock, pull that cylinder, pull the gate and make the repairs so that we can um, 
you know, have controlled regulation of the, of the reservoir. It, there's really no damn safety issue here, but anytime you tell somebody a, the outlet controls are leaking, like it tends to raise some eyebrows. So, um, but it is under control and uh, we will have that hopefully repaired within the next month or so. Okay, great. Thank you. Any questions for Jason on his report? Okay, I don't see any. Thank you for the report, Jason. All right, next item, um, 10A is a review of major, major project listings and items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings. Um, Ken or Wes, any, any staff, um, anything you wanna bring up there? I have nothing, no. Ken, any? Oh, okay, you're sorry you're freezing up on my screen there for a sec. Okay, um, all right, so we are on to, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find the right page here. We're on to item 11, which is informational items and water board correspondence. Um, do you have anything on informational items, Ken? I don't. Um, the only thing I was, I was gonna say is that uh, there's still a lot of, of activity going on on the Colorado River and Lake Powell and you know thing, uh, things that's going on there. Most recently, there was a uh, there's a project that the Bureau of Reclamation is looking on Lake Powell to for a pipeline out of Lake Powell to Southern Utah, and uh, you'll probably you've probably seen a little bit of. Uh, news uh, lately on that project. Um, be interesting to watch that project and as it progresses, it, it, it uh, might end up, probably gonna end up in, in a federal case <laughs> similar to our Windy Gap firming project. So uh, be interesting to watch that um, project. If we get additional information, I'll probably send you a couple of things uh, by email just for informational purposes. Uh, It'll be interesting to watch that. Some real big national politics on that. So it'll be interesting to watch that move forward. Okay. Um, in the last month we had, it was Gathia Weiss, I believe is her name. She made a presentation and um, that, um, oh, there was some CWCB materials regarding the drought contingency plans um, on Lake Powell were passed out. I, I, I did look at it. I don't know if the rest of the board had a chance, but, you know, I think what struck me as I read that um, is there's just a lot of variables <laughs> yeah. um, with regards to coming up with a drought contingency plan from funding to, um, you know, where is the water going to come from? Who's going to pay for it? I think um, obviously the that funding issue and given the issues with COVID, it's made that worse. Um, those are questions. And then how do you balance the supply? There's legal questions, environmental questions, but um, I, I appreciate her bringing it up. I, I think, you know, in the context of the Windy Gap Firming Project, um, I know there's uncertainty, but, um, you know, really I think that that uncertainty in my mind kind of plays to, you know, you don't know exactly how it's gonna play out, but having water in storage and having some capability to store water in the future is gonna be, in my mind, more important based on that, you know, some of the uncertainty that is brought up in those drought contingency uh, uh, materials. So anyway, I, I just wanted to mention, I did look at that and appreciated her bringing it up. So I don't know if there's any other questions or comment material. I don't see any. Um, item 12 is items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings. Uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, but cash and Lou are in here, and um, so we'll we'll and obviously with the key one, I think we're looking for is if there's any change with regards to the when you get up in the the long months cost breaker for um, can that you have future board meetings and scheduled. I think he's frozen up at least on my end. Boy, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Todd. I, I didn't catch any of that. I don't know if it was just me or. No, I didn't catch it either. Oh, I'm sorry. We were on item 12. Can you guys hear me now? I can now. 
Okay. Um, on item 12, did you have anything besides a cash and lieu is listed as a item for a future board meeting coming up in December? Is there anything else, Ken, that, that you want to uh, make us aware of for a, a future board meeting? Um, just the button rock um, management plan we'll be bringing this fall. Uh, okay. I, it, I don't know which month, but um, that will that we will really appreciate water board input um, and and review of that plan. So okay. kind of a heads up, got some homework to do. <laughs> that comes forward to you. Sounds good. All right. Well, the only other thing um, is to adjourn the meeting, I guess, to, to um, leave everybody once again. Welcome, Scott. Um, I'm glad to, to see uh, see your smiling face and thank you for everybody attending the meeting. And um, anyway, anything else for the good or the word? Hey, Williams. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Allison. Uh, yes, I was uh, wondering, I don't know if this technically counts as a meeting, but um, if we might be able to do a tour of the infrastructure with Mr. Houston, um, that is Scott Willick and I. Me? Go ahead, Ken. Um, yeah, absolutely. We, we would be delighted be able to do that tour anytime with anybody um, with the COVID stuff we'll have to have to be careful how we do that but that's certainly something um, if, if we did it just uh, you know a few of us at a time could even do this fall I think depending on how comfortable people would be with that and I certainly at any time we could set up a, a, a broader uh, you know the, the whole water board if, if we want to do something like that uh, we could also set one up um, next spring if, if that's not too late. So just give us a feeling for when you would like to do that. And uh, we can make it a little bit bigger event if it's next spring, but we certainly can take any, wa any individual water board member out um, this fall, I think. We'll get Allison, that. what's your thoughts? Would you like to do something this fall or are you okay waiting until the spring? I'm fine either way. I do think it would be helpful at some point just to get a better understanding on the ground to actually get a recite visit. But um, given all the surrounding circumstances, um, I'm more than understanding if we want to hold off. Okay. Um, well, can I, uh, I guess, maybe look at the city policy with regards to doing mm -hmm. that sort of tour and then maybe if you could get back the email to the board um, on what works um, and maybe at a minimum what you could do is try to line something up with Allison and Scott to get them more familiar with the system and then if it allows based on city policy you could email the rest of the board and any of, any of us can attend maybe we could add on to it and then you know hopefully if things lighten up in the spring we could do something a little bit more formal at that point but mm -hmm. I hear Allison it'd probably be good to you know if you actually see it on the ground it really helped me when I first got on the board so I think that's a great idea. Yeah, good. Thank you for that idea. We'll, we'll look into it. Okay, great. Well, I don't have anything else on the agenda, and unless anybody else does, I think um, we'll go ahead and uh, adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.